Kant, writing in the 1780s, mid-1780s, in, in terms of his moral theory, says that a right action can neither be judged by its consequences nor hinge to any experience of pleasure or pain. So what is enjoyable or pain-free is not always, Kant points out, what is moral. We left utilitarianism with a short story by Ursula Le Guin, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. And I asked you to really think about whether you'd be one of those people who would um, stay in a community, the ut utopian nature of which depended on the subjugation, oppression, torture of an innocent child. Now remember, when it comes to uh, utilitarianism, Bentham would probably simply say, let's put the um, situation through the calculating machine. Let's think about the fecundity of the situation in terms of the pleasure and pain. Let's think about the you know, intensity, the duration. And then obviously, let's think about the extent, how many people are affected by this um, situation. Obviously, the child in the cage is affected a great deal, but so too is the utopian society. So uh, the utilitarian would probably um, suggest that maybe we should stay in Omelas and, and stay without any particular moral qualms. Let me say that again. The utilitarian might say that we should stay in Omelas and without any particular moral qualms. Um, just because the calculation worked out that way. If you find this morally objectionable or just in the pit of your stomach, you just don't feel that an innocent child should suffer just for, you know, for the sake of a wider community and do so in a really grotesque way, you need to ask yourself as a philosopher, do I have a good argument to protect this child? Do I have a good argument by the same token to protect uh, the victim of the organ harvest that Philippa Foote gives us. Uh, do I have some sort of argument that uh, will say, you shall not pass, like you do not get to violate my rights or the rights of this innocent child uh, for any particular reason? So when we turn to deontology, deontologists, and particularly Immanuel Kant writing in the 1780s, is going to give us this type of argument. Kant is concerned that we sacrifice individuals for the sake of the community. And what he's going to do is he's going to give us a moral framework that actually puts the locus of moral value in the individual. And the question is, why? I mean, Kant, Kant needs to give us a reason, and he does. As we're working through these three moral frameworks, virtue ethics, con consequentialism, or utilitarianism, and deontology, I would urge you to think that in practical terms, you're not going to find a deontologist who can't understand the position that utilitarianism is given, giving. Similarly, you're not going to find a utilitarian who thinks that moral character is complete bunk, right? You're going to find these schools of thought and different theorists within these schools of thought developing different strains. But for the sake of a per particular type of heuristic or a shorthand, introductory to normative ethics, what we've done is we take them in three separate schools, and we take them historically. First comes virtue ethics, then comes utilitarianism many, many hun hundreds of years later, and then on the heels of utilitarianism comes deontology. So, as a reminder, deontology comes from the um, Greek word deon, which means duty. It's the stud study of duty or ethical obligation not only to others, but also ethical or moral obligations that we have to ourselves. So Kant, writing in the 1780s, mid-1780s, in, in terms of his moral theory, says that a right action can neither be judged by its consequences nor hinge to any experience of pleasure or pain. So what is enjoyable or pain-free is not always, Kant points out, what is moral. It comes coming back to a type of very, very old idea that in fact 
um, to do something moral is not always pleasurable. Um, you know, we can think about uh, the virtuous individual in Aristotle's virtue ethics. Uh, the virtuous individual knows what virtue is, does the virtuous action, and experiences some sort of pleasure for doing that virtuous action. And this is the place that we'll agree with Kant. Even if there are aspects of doing that action that are displeasurable or unpleasurable or painful. Okay. And Kant suspects that when something is comfortable, right? Something when, when our actions are comfortable or physically pleasing, that should be a uh, at least a sign that we uh, should turn our moral lens on this action a little more carefully because it might be a sign that we're doing something in our self-interest, which as we'll see, Kant's going to suggest that there's a real tension between moral obligation and self-interest. So Kant also wants to point out that good actions can be painful and bad ones can be pleasurable and bad ones usually are pleasurable, okay? Uh, like if we think about Gyges, for example. So he wants to say that the pain or pleasure associated with an action is what he calls contingent, not necessary. So contingent simply means uh, some people will experience one action, have a particular pleasure associated with it, and then in another case, someone might not. The pleasure is contingent or on the side of uh, the action, uh, not necessary to uh, the actions. So actions should be judged by their for Kant, their motives and their intentions and the rules that guide the action, okay? Uh, that is to say, it's the, the maxim of the action, the rules that guide the action. Very simply for you folks, ask yourself, are your actions guided by rules or are your actions simply habitual? Are they pleasurable? Are you trying to cultivate virtue? These are different ways of thinking about your moral life. And Kant's going to say, think about your actions as being a product and being judged on the basis of rules and your intentions behind those actions. Okay, So morality, for the deontologist, morality is not, about, is not a matter of consequences, but rather an, an issue of duty following from moral commands. Moral commands are what Kant calls imperatives. So if, if all of this sounds very strict to you, uh, there's a reason for that. Kant grew up in Konigsberg, um, when, what was Prussia, and um, he develops what many contemporary theorists call a strict father morality. There's not a particular a huge amount of joy in Kant's moral theory. If utilitarianism is based off hedonism and off of pleasure and pain and trying to maximize happiness, Kant says, get real. If you pursue pleasure and pain and maximize happiness, you are going to inevitably sacrifice individual rights and the moral standing of individuals within your communities. So think about Kant's theory as a criticism of utilitarianism hedonism, but also divine command theory. Now you might say, hold on, Keg, you just told me that Kant has a strict father morality going on. In other words, you know, you follow the commands and the imperatives. Uh, that sounds a lot like divine command theory. In other words, that God tells the priests who tells us what to do, or God tells the kings who tell us what to do. Now, um, the difference between Kant and divine command theory is that Kant believes that the imperatives that we give ourselves in our moral lives that guide our actions don't come from any particular uh, king. They don't come from God in the sense of being a commandment that we might not want to do and don't understand. Rather, the imperatives and the moral commandments that we, we take as the guides for our actions, we actually give ourselves those imperatives. 
and that they are rational imperatives. That's what Kant's going to suggest. Um, this is the difference for Kant between um, autonomy and heteronomy. What do I mean? Kant suggests that in hedonism, utilitarianism, and divine command theory, that individuals operate in a position of heteronomy. Heteronomy means that uh, your actions are dictated by someone or something or some force else. Okay, something else, hetero, something else. Okay, and it comes down on us in a particular way and forces us to act. Kant's moral theory is completely antithetical to this heteronomous position. Kant says that true morality must come out of autonomy, the ability to rationally choose a course of action for oneself on the basis of particular imperatives and maxims. There is no reason why everyone shouldn't have access to the very best education. Welcome to Calculus One. To introduction to astronomy. The introduction to philosophy. To statistics. Microeconomics. Psychology. Let's get started.